Thank you very much. I feel as if we're heading a bit into the graveyard shift. Um, but I promise you, there's going to come a point when I'm talking where I think I am going to get everyone's attention. Um, yeah, I don't think you'll be smiling. Um, thanks, Jackie. Um, I think it's worked out very well that I'm talking after you because I'm going to try and link in a bit of what I'm saying to access to justice and to give two very practical examples. I'm going to issue a disclaimer before I begin. I am definitely no expert in prisons, <laughs> but I'm going to pull a few things together and then link it more in terms of the work which the South African Human Rights Commission has done around prisons and also some of the work which I have been involved in and how it links to prisoners. I suppose just so that everyone knows, I think in South Africa now, from the census, we've got, what, 55, some people say maybe 60 million people in our country. I yeah, stand under correction, yeah, we're around there. Um, and we have... Let me get this right. And we have 157,000 inmates in our prisons in 2015, of which 115,000 are sentenced prisoners. Um, and in 1994, at the dawn of our democracy, um, the prison population stood around 110,000 prisoners. Um, of which 92,000 were sentenced. So we've basically gone from 92 to 115,000 prisoners. Uh, so that's just to give you an idea in terms of where we stand. I think, though, in terms of how South Africa has done, certainly people who work in this area had really thought that when you have a president such as Nelson Mandela, who had spent 27 years of his life in prison, that this would certainly be an area that would receive attention post-1994. Um, and particularly the fact that so many people sitting in our parliaments, sitting in our government, had been imprisoned during the apartheid era and I think what is tragic, and I'm going to give a few examples, is that we possibly have not moved forward. And certainly on this score, there is so much more that we should have done. And this is where I'm going to wake everyone up, and if you're squeamish, you may wish to leave the room. Um, I read this in Parliament once. There's a place called St. Albans Prison in South Africa in Port Elizabeth, and an incident took, there, it took place there in 2005 where a prison warder was killed. It was rumoured that he was a family member of a very well-placed person, within highly placed person within South Africa. The guards shut down the prison and they took their revenge going to read to you some of the testimony from one of those prisoners as to what happened. Siko alleged he had endured at its hands much torture. In addition to having been forced to strip naked and lie on the cement floor with his nose in the anus of the inmate in front of him, Siko said he was electroshocked, beaten with batons and assaulted. He was also forced to lie naked for two days in midwinter on the wet concrete floor of a single cell in his own blood and bodily fluids. A still visibly traumatized Siko broke down while describing how he was dragged naked from his cell to the prison's B section, where he said Warder Pariachi cuffed him by his legs and hands to a grill door in a crucifix position and instructed Warder Manuel to set his dog on him. And the dog kept on biting me. And the dog kept on biting me, biting my legs and my thighs up to my hips, he told the court. 
On one occasion, while lying naked in the corridor, Seacole said he saw two female warders beating people in their private parts with batons. Ladies were shouting, you're going to die, and your mouth's a puss. Those from South Africa will understand that. He recalled how he was dragged under a cold shower by his legs, repeatedly shocked and assaulted, as well as beaten on his testicles by a female warder, Lulu Kabase, and he fainted. Okay, I think I've got everyone's attention. So, this happened, okay, in South Africa. And a lawyer, and this goes to Access to Justice, found out about this matter because one of these prisoners was released and went to him. He was a commercial lawyer, Egan Oswald, in Port Elizabeth. He tried to sue the state and take the matter to court. Some technicalities came up. I can't quite remember if it was prescription or what it was, but technicalities came up. He went nowhere. He had accessed all um, parts that he could in South Africa and he decided, not knowing anything about international human rights law, and this is what is so remarkable, he decided, let's go to the UN. And he managed to lodge an individual complaint with the Human Rights Committee. <laughs> no one in South Africa knew about it. Um, and in, 20, in October 2010, the UN Committee, and this is the, only the second individual complaint in terms of individual complaints mechanisms that have been used in South Africa. The other one was a Rastafarian who, lawyer who wished to justify that he could smoke dope whilst on the job, um, but he did not succeed. I, I understand why, as I employed him. Um, in so in, in October 2010, the UN Committee on Human Rights found that South Africa had indeed violated several guarantees under the ICCPR, okay, um, and referred the matter back to South Africa formally requesting a response. What did South Africa do? Nothing. Ignored it. Kid you not. Thought it would go away. They then formally requested the South African government again in August 2011 to send a response. And in October 2011, they finally the UN got some meek and mild media statement, but certainly the South African authorities did nothing back home to let anyone know about this case. Somewhere along the lines, I was sitting in my, afternoon, I was sitting in my office one afternoon, and a colleague came rushing through to me and said, um, have you seen the Bradley McCallum case? It's like the Human Rights Committee in Geneva has just like issued these findings against us. And of course, we immediately piled into it, unbeknown to us, hadn't received media attention at all, um, sort of briefed all the commissioners, approached Parliament, and at the beginning of November in 2011, we were invited to Parliament to explain to them what had happened with the Bradley McCullum case, um, some of what I read to you now, I remember I read, and thank goodness, just as I had finished, a whole group of school children came in where we were um, meeting, but unfortunately, unfortunately the conversation had got a little bit tamer at that point. Um, but this just gives an indication as to, and I'm just raising it to show you that this is what is happening. It's not just one Bradley McCullum. He was one of 330 prisoners, okay, in that one incident who this happened to. And it's coming out more and more how this is more and more repeated in terms of South Africa. So that just goes to torture in prison. The other issue I want to pick up on is the conditions in our prison. They are horrendous. I think people can, will say that conditions have in fact got worse in terms of overcrowding in our prisons and just the general conditions of how um, prisoners are dealt with have certainly got really bad. Um, in South Africa, and particularly in the Western Cape where I live, we have some of the um, highest levels of tuberculosis, TB, in the world. Um, we're one of the TB capitals in the world. Um, and in our prison, particularly at the Polsmo prison in South Africa, 
um, you're pretty much guaranteed that if you go there for any period of time that you will get TB, okay? You cannot avoid it. Absolutely everything about the manner in which awaiting trial prisoners are incarcerated from the poor ventilation to the overcrowding to the unclean, uncleanliness to the um, smoking both of cigarettes and illegal substances and keeping that called the haichi burning, okay, so they can all light their cigarettes, passing it around mouth to mouth and I can go on and on and on and on. Absolutely everything will ensure that you get TB when you go to prison. And so there was one Bradley McCallum, no, sorry, one Dudley Lee, okay? And I'm telling the story because he landed up at the Constitutional Court. So Dudley Lee was, he was, you know, he was a white South African, like, led quite a comfortable life, I wouldn't say wealthy, but a comfortable life, wheeling and dealing in second-hand cars, um, and he landed up in Polsmo prison, not, not for a violence crime, more your blue co color, I think, fraud or something like that. He landed up being there, he went in a very, very healthy man. He landed up being there for four years, over 70 court appearances, and all charges against him were discharged. He came out of prison, though, a very, very different man. He came out of prison completely incapacitated. His life had basically been destroyed and he would never work another day in his life and he would live in a place for homeless people. He was determined to sue and he approached a lawyer who decided to take on this case. Um, basically a pro bono sort of way who took on this case and took the matter first to the High Court where they were successful the court was the case then wasn't a constitutional matter. It was simply a delict or tort matter, okay, suing for damages, okay? The state, of course, took it on appeal. Um, so in the Supreme Court of Appeals, uh, this court came up with some very, very strange logic. The logic basically amounted to, if I could put it in simplest terms, was that Dudley Lee needed to prove on which day in the cell he was sitting and at the precise point in time when which prisoner spat the germs and proved that those germs gave him TB. I mean, that's the extreme in terms of causation, what this court wanted, which would essentially mean that in these kind of cases and so many other cases in terms of the right of access to health, might as well not have that provision in the Constitution. And so the lawyer had no option, but was forced at this stage to take it to the Constitutional Court, um, and also was very fortunate that by then a whole lot of NGOs had become aware of the case. They came on board, entered as an amicus curiae, and off it went to the Constitutional Court, where it, the Supreme Court of Appeals was reversed, okay, and Daddy Lee, Lee won. What did he get, though, at the end of the day? At the end of the day, it can be estimated that legal fees in that matter must have been well in excess of three million rands. In South Africa, it's not like the United States, okay? He got 270,000 rands during the course of 2013. That is a pittance for what he went through, and he died a year later. Um, so this case, I think, just demonstrates in terms of access to justice and what it means and what the struggle is for access to justice. Um, and just as a postscript to say, I lived through the Dudley Lee matter. Um, I lived with the person who was his lawyer, my husband. Um, <laughs> that's why I have an intimate knowledge <laughs> of the case. But I think it indicates as to in terms of access to justice, that in these instances, in prisons, if something happens to you, unless you find a lawyer who's just willing to take your case on, who so happens to be interested or passionate about the law, you're going to be denied access to justice. And I think the conditions in prison have also been backed up more recently by the fact that our constitutional court judges are allowed to go and inspect prisons. And I think there one really 
um, can't underestimate how important this right which judges have, have got. And I think that not enough judges in South Africa exercise this right. Justice Cameron, one of our Constitutional Court judges, went off to Palsmo to see had things improved. And he said, quoting from his report, he was deeply shocked, this was in September last year, at the extent of overcrowding, the emaciated prisoners, filthy cramped cells, prisoners with rashes and boils, blocked drain, prisoners who must use a sink to both bathe and urinate. Um, they're like no curtains in front of the toilet. It's like, you know, there would be five times as many people in this room, okay, you all have to sit together, and there would, like, be a toilet over there, okay, and you must just go use it in front of everyone, okay. Um, not enough, certainly not beds. In some cells you take chances sleeping, blanks and sheets missing or filthy and lice infested, okay. So our constitutional court judge saw, okay, last year. Um, so when then even questions, did Dudley Lee have any impact? And does our government even learn that they're going to be sued again and again and again? Yes, they have done some things because to prevent TB, and this is what the court pointed out, there are so many practical things they could just implement almost immediately and that would hardly cost any money. They can make this problem go away. But have they done it? No. So how many more times are they going to have to be sued and how much more money? It seems as if they prefer to give the money to the state lawyers and the lawyers, okay, than to actually Im improve the conditions in prison. Um, and then just lastly on the conditions in prison almost immediately after Justice Cameron's report came out last year, some correctional services officials actually said sort of quietly by the side that in their view, since the Dudley Lee matter, the conditions had actually got worse at Poles were not better, despite, despite correctional services going to Parliament and telling them about all these wonderful things that they have done so that they will not be sued again. So a couple of weeks after Justice Cameron was there, I don't know, have any of you ever heard of leptospirosis? My understanding, and I stand corrected, is that this is a disease which one gets in very, very filthy conditions, okay, and very rarely has it ever spread to humans. Well, in September last year, it has been admitted that one prisoner in Polsma died of leptospirosis. People reckon it's more than one prisoner died. They had to evacuate 5,000 prisoners from this Polsmo prison in order to clean it up. So that is the current dire, I think, situation in our prisons in um, South Africa. So just to wrap up, in terms of so how does the Human Rights Commission like fit into this, I've already spoken about the Bradley McCullum matter and how we can go to Parliament bring it to their attention, request, okay, that they conduct oversight, which is the role of Parliament, okay, um, and to ensure that they know about it and taking it to um, Parliament as well. Um, the cameras are always around Parliament. You can sort of get it onto, you know, the evening news. You can make sure that citizens out there know about it. Um, then in terms of more at a macro level, and I think this is where I've conducted some work over the years, is looking at your International Convention Against Torture, um, and first of all, lobbying for South Africa to, to comply with its international obligations to actually lodge the reports. At one stage, almost every single treaty body report was outstanding. This is something the Commission has been working on for years and years and years and years and taking it up at the highest levels within the executive. Last year there was a flurry and I think about five or six reports went to the UN and went to the African Commission um, and one of the reports that went was the CAT report. But you also have the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture in terms of which government must set up a national preventative mechanism. And I think 
it's in that area that the Commission has been doing a lot of work to lobby and advocate for ensuring that structurally the system <coughs> is changed and that you have this independent um, monitoring mechanism made up of people visiting the prison so that you can start dealing with these issues on a macro level rather than on a case-by-case -case basis or a Dudley Lee case where, you know, one prisoner gets to the Constitutional Court like seven or eight years later. Um, there's also other areas we've worked is to ensure that we actually have torture legislation in South Africa. That's also something at the Commission we work very closely on with that legislation going through Parliament. And then in terms of just at the Commission influencing the international processes to ensure that we get the recommendations that we want, okay, for our government. So in the universal periodic review process, taking place and making it very, very clear to the state's parties as to what recommendations we would like in, in South Africa, and actually being very successful in that, sometimes even getting almost word for word out of the UPR process, what it is that we have asked for. So I think I will leave it there. I see my time's running out. I don't know if there's time for um, questions. Um, but certainly we need to continue. Um, and um, there's still a lot of work to be done for transformation in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to field a few questions? Yeah. Or comments? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, just to say that um, it's, it's something that um, we really hold on part to is to assist um, the reasons we have it, um, it um, yeah. and it's, it's a bunch of uh, actually journalists, yes. they're not lawyers, Caroline. Um, but it's access, I think it's, it's access, I can't remember yes. the names, but, um, <coughs> and they are, I mean, they have, yeah, they are, they report numerous incidents of torture going yeah. on in an art prison. And um, we were actually asked to intervene in the system. One, one instance of what was happening there, there was um, multiple accusations of torture, and we sent out lawyers and went and, and, and suggested, um, actually, the fact that um, these prisons had been beaten up um, and they had been denied access to medical systems. And so, um, we, we sent out lawyers and um, we, we tried to get immediate access to this, which was impossible. Um, yeah. Because there's a protocol, you actually have to get, although there is, they recognize the rights of prisoners to legal representation, um, you actually have to apply via the, um, the Provincial Commissioner of, of Correctional Services, and that took 24 hours. And, you know, in a torture case, yeah, a, a lot. Yeah. Um, you, you need to get you need to get doctors, you know, to actually to 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 and I met her, in fact, about three months ago. And she said to me, and she, and she said, I didn't realize, she said it was accidental that she was sitting in Parliament that day when I did the presentation. And she was so shocked and outraged about what she heard, okay, that she made it like a crusade. She flew back to, to the Wits Law Project and said, guys, you've got it all wrong what you're doing. We have to focus on this area of work. And that is how the redirection of the work came. And I mean, she's a phenomenal supporter in terms of tracking and supporting these cases, supporting someone like Egan Oswald, who is um, the, um, the McCullum lawyer, who's still working on these cases and still trying to find justice for the victims. Yeah. I just ask you, um, you both focused a lot on these external monitoring, whether it's from the CAD or the ICCPR committees at the UN or from journalism. How much does that outside scrutiny help to respond to the inevitable um, position of governments that they don't have the money to improve conditions in prisons, to provide um, resources for pro bono lawyers and so forth? 
because we always know that every government could reprioritize yeah. less money for the military, less money for um, uh, other things, we'll just leave it there. Yeah. Does it help? In yeah. those kinds of yeah. Okay, so what I didn't mention is we do have an independent body, however the Human Rights Committee just a few weeks ago questioned its independence, called the Judicial Inspectorate for Correctional Services. The unfortunate part is it's, it's, it's like a pretty uh, toothless um, bulldog in that the people who work there are so enormously frustrated. They go to Parliament every year. They draw the attention of parliamentarians to what is going on in prison, um, and yet parliament does very little. Um, they were delighted with the Dudley Lee matter. Um, in terms of, and how I would respond at this point, of, point in time to your question, is that for as long as they can spend so much money, and a few years ago there was an allocation in the correctional services budget for one billion rands, they, just under one billion rands, for the next financial year they would have to pay out for lawyers because they were being sued. That for as long as we have that situation, I don't want to hear justifications that they don't have money, okay? And for as long as, for example, and it's set out in the Dudley Lee case, there are systems that they can put in place that will not cost money, okay, which would drastically reduce, okay, the amount of TB in prisons. Um, so until we get to that point where they're not wasting, okay, citizens' money um, on, you know, things being sued, and until they just practically start doing things, I don't think they can say that. And I think very often in South Africa, you know, people try and or government tries to say, we don't have money. And I think very often it's actually not a case of money. It's not always throwing money at the problem in South Africa which would resolve it. And I think education is a perfect example there of how we one of the countries in, in Africa which spends the most on education, yet have the most appalling education system. So let's get there and then we'll deal with the argument. Thanks.